France and its labor unions square off again. Another round of industrial action cripples parts of the public sector after weeks of strikes take refineries and fuel stations offline. Is the action justified or does it put crucial energy production and the economy at risk? I'm Andrea Sankey and today's newsmaker is France on Strike. If there's one country that knows how to organize a strike, it's France. Just a couple of days after protests over high inflation, several unions have staged a nationwide labor strike. Public transportation has been cut by half, public schools have been disrupted, and while oil refinery workers also walked off the job, the government took the controversial step of forcing some to get back to work. That only seems to have made the public angrier. But their ire isn't just over the rising cost of food and fuel. It's also about what they see as the dysfunction of the French government and especially President Emmanuel Macron. We'll discuss all of that in a minute, but first, this report. Labor strengths are routine in French politics, but now they're coming at a time of unusual turmoil in the country. Political infighting has left parliament in disarray, Refinery workers have walked off the job amid an energy crisis, and inflation continues to grow. Now, Sunday's march in Paris has turned into a nationwide strike. The leader of France's Unbowed Party called it the Great Convergence. We are at a time when all the components of the French people, the employees, those who are not, whether they are unemployed or studying, must unite and form this sort of thing that I call the popular front. Let's say, in fact, against a government which does not back down, nor stops at almost nothing. Marching alongside the protesters on Sunday was this year's Nobel laureate for literature, Annie Arnaud. She echoed their demands, calling for wage increases, lowering the age of retirement, higher taxes on the rich, and more action on climate change. The left-wing opposition says this long list of demands is aimed directly at President Emmanuel Macron. Today is a demonstration of strength, a march on social rights, on climate, on retirement at the age of 60 for partners and the political world to come together to show that another world is finally possible if we are all together and all united. But Macron's budget minister claims the opposition is exploiting the situation. Speaking on French radio station Europe One, he said today's march is a march of supporters who want to block the country. But Macron's centrist alliance is already in crisis. It lost its parliamentary majority after June's elections. Macron also angered taxi unions after leaked documents showed that he lobbied in favor of the third-party driving app Uber. And critics say his $20 billion relief package has not been enough to fight inflation. I'm here today because I'm angry. I'm angry because everything is going wrong. Public services, mistreatment at work, and the super profits that are not taxed. We have a lot of reasons to be here today. And the government that doesn't listen to us, that continues to favor the same people, and that asks us for efforts from the same people. At some point, this has to stop. To compound Ocron's misery are the oil refinery strikes. While energy prices continue to rise, oil companies are making record profits. And while some unions have reached an agreement with oil executives, the hardliner General Confederation of Labor hasn't budged. The situation has disrupted fuel supplies, causing drivers to wait in long queues at petrol stations. I left home at 10.15 a.m. It's almost 12, 11.40 a.m. and I'm still in my car. I haven't got there yet. I've been here for more than an hour and a half and I find it very long. And then there are people honking their horns. People are angry. You can feel it. It's almost like people are arguing, fighting. I think it's a shame. And amidst all this national anger, Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne is set to pass next year's budget via decree instead of a vote. If this happens, the opposition might respond with yet another no-confidence motion. 
one that just might cripple the government. Well, joining me now to talk further about the French strikes and their consequences are from Paris, French journalist and author Anne Elizabeth Moutet. From London, we have Philippe Marlière, a professor of French and European politics at University College London. And completing our panel from Nottingham is Paul Smith, an associate professor in French history and politics at University of Nottingham. Thanks all so, so much for being with us. Uh, Anne Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. I mean, this is generally, it's pretty routine for France come the fall season. But uh, this year, we're looking you know, at massive inflation and a potential energy crisis. Are these strikes really necessary, and will they have the intended impact, or could they potentially even backfire? I would say that the feeling in Paris in general is uh, a, a, a desire to express anguish. They, there's a feeling, and that's that's not new. I mean, that you can at least date it from the time of the Yellow Vest four years ago, but you can even go backwards uh, much more in French tradition, is people will, the government will not hear us if we don't express our worries, and the worries are higher than they have been in some time. Uh, people go to the shops and they're not able to buy what they used to buy before. Uh, they worry that they won't be able to heat their homes. They worry that they won't be able to close their, their, uh, uh, their children. I mean, it's, it's very, very, very basic. Uh, and, and there's an economic anguish, there's political anguish because of the war in Ukraine. It's a kind of perfect storm. So okay. when uh, Nupes and Jean-Luc Mélenchon called for uh, this march la on, on uh, Sunday, two days ago, and the, the day of strike today, uh, they were heard also because uh, there was a feeling that uh, the whole country was in, in, in this kind of uh, insecurity. Okay. So, Philippe Marlier, do you think there will be, I mean, obviously there are going to be, as always, some a level of economic consequence for, you know, kind of crippling business for whatever amount of time uh, this takes. But what about the political consequences? I think it's quite early days to say what will be the political consequences. I think it will become uh, quite serious for Macron and the government if uh, um, uh, Elizabeth was re reminding us of the yellow vest, which uh, the movement which started four years ago. Uh, at the beginning of it, uh, it was so massive, so sudden that uh, the government had really to stand back and, and, and listen and, and take some initiative. So I think it will all depend on that, the, how those marches and strikes impact on the economy in general. I see that there are, it's an interprofessional uh, strike today. So there are s several sectors which are affected by it, not simply transport or people working in refineries, but also uh, teachers, uh, pupils, students on strike. Mm. Uh, you know, it's a it's a vast really range of, of of categories of people. So that probably could could be could impact on, on on Macron. Let's not forget that Macron will not run again in four years' time, and he doesn't have a majority in the House. Right, and I mean he survived the Yellow Vest movement. So, uh, Paul Smith, let me come to you. Has the government's decision here, when we talk about political consequences, its decision to force workers back to work? Uh, has that helped the unions in this case who say that the government has tried to compromise the treasured right to strike? Yes, I think I think to some extent that's helped. Certainly the, the response of the uh, the more moderate unions has been to uh, a gesture of solidarity with their sometimes uh, more radical uh, brothers and sisters in the CGT and so forth. Uh, so that hasn't gone over well, and that's what today is partly about, the right to strike as well as the, the cost of living crisis. But I think, as Philippe says, it is very early days. This is the kind of the first test. And I think that this is a test not just for the government, it's also a test for the left. Um, you know that there's there's a big uh, there's a big question mark over the leadership of Nupes and its relationship with the trade unions. Um, will this be another yellow vest movement? Again, very early days, very difficult to say. But as as you yourself said, I think at the top, Andrea, this is it's what happens every October. It's really a question of what comes out of this that will be mm. will we, tell us something about the next step. And of course, in the background, we've also got the uh, the, the matter of the budget being voted in, in Parliament. Right. I want to talk more about that in a second, but I wanted to look as well, Anna Elizabeth, I'll come to you, uh, about the state of, you know, solidarity between the trade unions themselves. I mean, as for the CGT, 
why wasn't 7% pay rise, you know, plus a bonus good enough for them when the even bigger CFDT uh, union and the CFE CGC accepted that after negotiations with Total Energies? It kind of says a bit about the solidarity of the laborers and their unions themselves, does it not? Well, uh, CGC uh, is really the... the uh... Uh, uh, management, uh, uh, sort of middle management union, it's a slightly different situation. Uh, CFDT plays more ball and they decided it was all right. CGT is a there is a very specific situation. Right now, they need to make their voices heard. Uh, there's a national congress of CGT, which is supposed to uh, either replace or reconduct the current secretary general, uh, Philippe Martinez. And there's, uh, there's also internal policies. There's also the fact that the uh, right now, working with the man, working with management is not something that's very popular. All French unions realize that a great deal of uh, the movements that are now developing, including NUPES, the alliance, the sort of uneasy alliance of the left wing parties, uh, mm. is passing them by. There are at least two unions which are never named Attack and Sud, which are more radical unions and which are not because they're more recent, have not been brought into the partnership uh, with which, for instance, the uh, traditional unions co-administer with the government uh, the social welfare system. So all of this means that CGT needs to have more credibility, and uh, that's part of it. But mm. that's also the fact that the federation in the oil refineries, especially, I mean, it's, it's all grown from that, <clears throat> is more radical than the secretary general. So that was also a question of catching up. It's, it's complicated. Yeah, it is complicated because, I mean, some suspect with the CGT, you know, losing membership over the years, you know, maybe they're making an attempt here to increase their profile as, you know, kind of a, a flagging union by digging in their heels against even other unions. That's at least one suspicion. But Philippe, I want to come to you about why protesters are on the streets uh, at, at this point in time. Because as Anne Elizabeth had said, she thinks it's generally about anguish. And we're also hearing that some of the factors coming into play here are global warming even, that they're frustrated with the fact that not enough has been done to combat uh, climate change by the French government. How much is that playing? There are different things at play, you're right. I think, the f first of all, it's also in solidarity with the uh, people working in the refineries who have been obliged by the government to go back to work. So there's a sort of an element of solidarity. But I think essentially it's about wages, wages in the context of high inflation. So, of course, the spending power, as the French put it, has declined and they find it harder, of course, to, to make ends meet, uh, to pay the bills, to buy goods. And so, of course, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and, and, and also uh, fear for, for, for the future. Uh, yes, climate is also an issue. It was more of an issue, to be fair, on Sunday, when, uh, which was, could be labeled a kind of a march of the left, all the left wing mm -hmm. parties which are part of the NUPS, the NUPES, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, aggregated that uh, issue, which in a sense makes makes sense. You know, it's a very extremely important issue, and I think uh, it's part of the left to really uh, bring it forward. But I think essentially today, it's a more traditional, it's the day of the unions and salaried workers. And they're there essentially, I think, uh, for wages, better wages. And I think it's a very complex situation for the government, because which is well aware that wages are lagging behind. There are profits to be made by, by firms who are doing okay, but people on the ground, workers, are struggling. So you can hear the government making recommendation to uh, firms and bosses. You know, you should, when you can, increase the wages. But of course, mm. it's, it falls largely on deaf ears. Right. I mean, adding to the complexity for the government right now, Paul Smith, is, uh, you know, Macron's government planning to force through its, its 2023 budget, as you mentioned, without a parliamentary vote. I mean, what do you think that's going to cost Macron politically? Or, I don't know, might he be rewarded for it when, you know, his supporters see him taking a hard line and pushing through what he promised to do? Yeah, I think, I think you've, uh, you've very much hit the nail on the head there. But it's a question of, the big question is, what's the mood of the country? Uh, and this is why this is a test for actually pretty much all the players, government, unions, the left. Uh, the, the, what is it that the, the, the French public will actually wear? 
the use of 49.3, the idea of the, the vote without a debate, the, the, the block vote mechanism, which is there if governments need it. That's why de Gaulle and Dubai put it there in the first place. That's the mechanism that they can use. It will, it will also, of course, force the, the opposition to vote one way or the other. And we might see you know, a motion of no confidence and all that going down. Um, but I think that it's this is really a whole there are a whole, a whole lot of different factors playing, as as uh, as everybody else has said. But also that this is really where we find out what the French people are thinking. Uh, and I'm not absolutely sure. I mean, those of us, I think all of us can probably remember 1995 and when the strike movement broke out in 1995. And what really shocked the government, Jacques Chirac and Alain Juppé was that actually the public generally supported the movement. And that was the real kind of foul moment. But it's the, the big question is, is the mood in the country the same now as it was in December 19? Everybody is suffering from the cost of living crisis. I don't, you know, everybody is aware of that. Everybody's feeling it. But is the public mood one of, you know, getting behind it even at arm's length? Or is this... You know, is it going to fall flat on its face? And that's why it's a challenge right across the piece. Yeah. You know, it's a... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's just may I add something. I, I totally agree with my what my colleague just said, but I think the... I think it's a big test, and the test is popularity, as he as he said, and I agree. And look at the ongoing movement in uh, uh, of strike in refineries, you know. And I think this movement, I've been following the figures, the the opinion polls. That movement remains, I wouldn't say popular. That would be uh, too big a word, but it's not deeply unpopular, and that's quite surprising because you you could argue, you know, people are not being able to uh, fill the tank. And use their car because now there's been a really real shortage of, of petrol mm. across France, and 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 when you can get some, uh, you need to queue for a very long time. So that's that's not that's not nice. However, uh, people seem to be uh, taking it, you know, uh, with uh, some some patience. And that reminds me, I agree with the parallel with 1995. 1995 strikes in the public sector with mass support from people who were, were not uh, public service workers. So it was a, a kind of a support from outside, if you like, of the strike. And, and that's why I think it, it led to uh, sort of a, a big, big instability for, for the government. And, and, and later Chirac had to dissolve the, the National Assembly and mm. call for early elections. You know, I think for non-French people watching uh, this panel, and uh, Paul, you said it, that this could possibly try to answer what are the French thinking uh, when we try to analyze these protests right now? Because that's the question so often coming from outside, not just in this case, but in all the years. I mean, you're talking about just in reference to 1995. This has been decades, centuries uh, of French, we'll call it political culture. Um, so Anne-Elizabeth Moutet, I mean, how, how much are, what are expectations really? Let's put it that way. What are expectations actually for the strikers when we know this is just part of, of an ongoing routine, it seems, at least from the outside, is real change ever really expected? It really, it really depends on which strikers, because as uh, we've listed them earlier, you've got, you've got the, the, the refineries people, you've got uh, doctors, you've got nurses, you've got teachers, and each of them have got specific <clears throat> grievances, and some of these grievances are, uh, have come to breaking point. And I would say that actually the oil industry uh, strikers will eventually get a deal, they will get a bit more money, the CGT will say we've won, and the CGT, once, it's, uh, once they've elected the new secretary general, what they want is to sort of basically flex the muscle and then go on uh, and, and look forward to, to the future. It's very different for teachers, um, for instance, or nurses, that they are a very good example of people whose uh, actual income has gone down thanks to inflation mm. and to uh, um, um, cuts made by consultants trying to make uh, uh, the health system or the school system more efficient. It has just... Uh, they are less considered, they're less well paid. If you take a, 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 star, a starting salary for a teacher in France, it used to be an equivalent to twice the minimum wage and now it's 1.25 the minimum wage. We're talking a, a real loss of purchasing power. 
as Philippe was saying, and also the feeling that increasingly uh, teachers, nurses, all the people who are in contact with the public are being made to manage a social situation that is more fraught in France. And they are, in effect, uh, uh, social workers and not call social workers in situations that are more difficult. So mm. that is something that is not going to end with one day strike. That is something that could potentially explode uh, uh, in other ways in the in the weeks and months to come. Okay, but I, that, that's what still baffles me. I mean, if they know that this could potentially explode, why don't they take this kind of preemptive action? Why don't they foresee the problems before it comes to massive strikes on the street? I mean, uh, Paul, wait. What, Go ahead. Uh, wait, I mean, this government, the sp specifically this government, Emmanuel Macron, is a government that seems to have been winging it. They announce great programs, great plans, great designs. It never happens. And it is the, the state of in preparation is something that now most and more and more observers are saying, look, you know, you can't go on and say you have a plan. Nothing is organized for the plan. Uh, McKenzie uh, we sweeps in and essentially cuts costs. Uh, it, there is no, uh, there's no ideological drive in this. Now, it's neither left nor right. I mean, it is, and it's both at the same time. You know that when Macron was first elected, coming seemingly out of the blue in uh, 2017, his great sort of expression was, en même temps, at the same time, we can be both things, all things to all men, and we can do left and right at the same time. And it turns out that not only uh, is this more difficult than expected, but also that the government seems to be essentially sort of feeling the wind in the morning and doing and sort of giving out money or giving out or refusing money in a completely non-prepared way. Mm. There were almost a hundred uh, um, uh, billion uh, uh, euros that were spent in various uh, bonuses, uh, aids, benefits, etc. after the Yellow Vest movement. And do you see any result apart from that? None of it was structured to go with a specific policy looking forward. Okay. So that's the real problem. Uh, we're down to our last few minutes. Paul, let me put this to you. I mean, just looking forward, would there ever be a way to, in a sense, change French culture and this kind of, I'll call it antagonism, that actually fuels this seemingly endless cycle of crippling strikes? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, that, that's, that, that's what you do, isn't it? You go on holiday in August, you come back in September, put in a bit of work, and then in October you, you go on strike. And then there's, this is, but, you know, this isn't only happening but in why? France. why? Why? Well, no, it's... It, yeah. it, it hinders it's everyone's life. I mean, I've been talking to my friends in Paris. They can't well, it's make... The same. Yeah. But it's the same in, in, in the UK at the moment. We've got railway strikes, we've got It doesn't happen strikes, quite as but... often in the UK, though. No, that's true, but but that's because this is this is you know a cultural construct. The French will go on strike, whereas the British don't go on strike. But actually, we do. But of course, everybody's looking at Liz Truss at the moment, so we're not wor worrying about the uh, the strikes. Mm. What is interesting, actually, I mean, I think I absolutely agree with Anne Elizabeth when she says uh, when she talks about the government winging it. That that we've seen this, and this is kind of the this is kind of the play out from the election back in April. That that there was no campaign, very little program. It took forever to get a prime minister. And now we're coming to, you know, four months later, when they could have actually put something together, they're really just improvising. And so you've got this marvelous idea of the, uh, what is it, the Conseil National de la, de la Refondation, but, you know, please. Um, that's, that, that's just yet more of what Macron does. There's a crisis, I call this big meeting, whether we call it the Grand Débat National or whatever we call it, but the outcome is exactly the same, nothing. Okay, and Philippe, so, yeah, let uh, me give Philippe a minute for his final right, thoughts, fine. go ahead. Why do French people go on strike so often or more often than any other nation? I, I suppose that, let's remember that strikes pay off, you know, most of the time, not always, you, you get something out of a strike, you get uh, uh, wages uh, increase and, and, and that's probably why they do it in the first place. I think there are other reasons, and just to name one, one important one is that it's a this additional weakness of French trade unions and political parties, and particularly trade unions. And uh, contrary to some uh, uh, opinion that one may have about about the French unions abroad, notably in the UK where I live, uh, the unions are very weak in France. They're very 
very few workers are unionized, less than in the UK. So it's very, very weak unions. And that's why, you know, you have a base workers, which at some point get really fed up and, and take to the streets. And most of the time, the unions don't even have to call for a strike. Of course, they, they're, they're there. They have to organize it. But it, it's really something which is part, in, which reflects, which is the sort of consequence of, of the weakness of of uh, labor forces in France, you know, political parties. I mean, it was a rather successful uh, march on Sunday, but you, you can't argue that the left in France today is strong. It is it is quite weak. I think the only the only political force which has been rising in France of, over the past years, which by the way doesn't do much, that we, you don't hear it much. It's it's the far right. It's it's Le Pen's uh, national rally. Okay. Philippe Marier, I will have to give you the final word because unfortunately we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank Paul Smith and Anne Elizabeth Mute as well for joining me and our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.